I'm still in the series about this radical Jesus and our radical response to him and our radical love for him. And um, today I want, to, I want to talk about Jesus in a new light, in a new way. And um, I entitled today's sermon, today's sermon, Scandalous Savior, the Radically Righteous Jesus. Because Jesus is going to push some buttons for us. And it's going to cause some scandal. And not scandal like we're seeing on TV or in the news or in the media. But a different kind of scandal that I want to talk about. But he's going to push some buttons for us. But that's all right. That's what it means to serve him. So I pray just that our hearts are open. That we will really learn how to follow the Lord. And follow him with great faithfulness. Let's be honest. How many of you have ever struggled with following or obeying something that God wants you to do? Yeah. And I'm not afraid to admit it. It gets to be tough, but I just, I want to do it, but then I don't want to do it. I told you already, I got two great fears in life, saying yes to Jesus, saying no to Jesus. I want to help us, those of us who are wrestling with what this means. To, to really be submitted to God's plan. I want to give us some strength in the word of God that will help us to say yes to him because it's what he requires of us. I want to talk about what happened during the last few days of Jesus' ministry on earth because after Jesus was raised from the dead, he lived among us for about 40 more days before he was ascended, roughly 40 days, and then he went to heaven and ascended to the right hand of the Father, and on the 50th day, he said, it's on Pentecost, which means 50th, um, he, sent the, he sent the Holy Spirit, which is what we see on the day of Pentecost. There's so many good things here in this passage and in, this, and in his story that I wanted to really soak into our hearts that would be changed by it. People were disheartened because of what Jesus did. Because Jesus pushed buttons. And he did it so that you would only receive truth if you wanted truth. Jesus will... will, will will dish up some food that you only eat it if you're really hungry. If you're choicy, you're going to starve. If you're finicky, you're going to starve. But if you're hungry, you ever get really hungry that you just eat stuff that you said you wouldn't eat? Like I said, I would never eat the you know what, I'm hungry. I'm going to plug my nose and put this stuff down. Stuff that you know is not right. You just get so hungry. Crazy stuff. So the Lord dishes up stuff so you got to really want his heart. But it's very interesting to me that the Lord would say, blessed is he or she or the person who will not be offended in him. I think it's very interesting that God would talk to us about not being offended by Jesus. Because you would think that he wouldn't care about being offended. Because you know, we'll say, look, I'm going to tell you something that's right. I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but if I do, I don't care because I'm trying to tell you what's right. Like, my doctor doesn't care how much a shot hurts. My dentist doesn't care how much an extraction hurts. Thank God I haven't had one of those since I was like eight. But if it's what you need, it's what you need. You can cry and wring your hands and all this kind of stuff. But if it's what you need, they're like, you know what? I'm committed to your recovery and he's got you a little bit of pain. We think that the Lord is committed to our comfort and our outcome. And sometimes your comfort hinders your good outcome. And so we need the role of the Spirit to comfort our hearts so that we can do things the way the Lord really wants us to do this. So today I want to talk about people who were offended by the Lord. Offended by his process, offended by what he had to say, offended by what he had to do. Not so that we can look down our noses at them, but so that we can see ourselves in Scripture and understanding how we get to this place as well. So Jesus is talking to folks. He's talking to them about John. And John comes to Jesus. I'm sorry, John sends his disciples to Jesus in Luke 7. Because John's in prison. Remember, John's standing for the word. John knows who Jesus is because when Jesus appeared, John said, Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. He knew who he was. Mm-hmm. But then Jesus, and this one I want you all to understand so that you know that you're in good company. There are days that Jesus does just what you think a Jesus should do. A lot of times on Sunday, Jesus does what you think he should do. The tears, the warming in her heart, the fluttering. Then there are days you want to say, Are you sure you Jesus? <laughs> If I don't hear you, I don't feel you, I don't see you, it doesn't make any kind of sense. You should have let me into this. You should have let me out of this. Where were you when I did this? 
So John's in jail. Herod is threatening to have him killed. Ultimately, he is going to be beheaded. We know this in the story. He says his disciples, the people try to couch it and say, maybe John wanted his disciples to know. But you got to understand, people, around this time, folks weren't sure who Jesus was. Because he wasn't fitting what people thought Jesus should do. It's very, very important. And you need to hold this in your heart because there will be times when Jesus will do things and you will think, this can't be Jesus. This is not how, this is not how he moves or how he works or how he acts. So John says to the disciples, they come to Jesus and say, John sent us to ask you, are you the one or should we look for another? Now that's a bold, that's a bold statement because one, John knows who Jesus is. They're boys. And John and Jesus are related. Remember, John left in his mother's womb when his mother Elizabeth heard Mary's voice while Jesus was inside her. So Mary's baby's kicking, Elizabeth's baby is kicking, they're doing that baby talking utero to each other. John responded to God's word and Jesus' voice before John even had the voice. Inside his mother's womb, he knew the voice of God. But yet, there's a turn Jesus took that John wasn't sure of anymore. And so John said to the disciples to say, are you the one to be looking for somebody else? Jesus didn't justify himself by saying, come on, tell John he knows the truth. Tell John to stop tripping. He said, tell John this. You remember what he told John? What he told John's disciples? Somebody just start shouting some of the stuff Jesus said in Luke 7. Tell them what you see. Tell them what you see. Who said that? Tell them what you see. The blind are seen. The deaf are hearing. The poor having the gospel preached to them because John knows sign. If I just tell John, yes, I am the one, then John might say, well, what did you feel when he said, I am? How did he look when he said, did a glow come on? Did his ears turn red? But if he said, tell him what you see, John would know this stuff can only happen by the Son of God. Okay, okay, okay. But listen, he then goes on to say, you know, John's a great prophet. He's been holding down the wall of all the prophets, born among women, John's the greatest. He, he gives John his kudos, even though John's asking his questions. But Jesus says in chapter 7, verse 23, you know what, blessed are people who are not offended by me. Because the word offended means something that's, that's, that's important for us to understand. In the Greek, it's, it's scandalon. It means reacting negatively to something. Offense means what we get the word scandal. And it means that, that we're reacting neg to, negatively to something we've heard. It means a trap or a snare. It's not merely anger, but it's something that clamps down on your limb and it won't let you go. He said, blessed are those who are not trapped because of me. Because John was starting to feel antsy because Jesus wasn't doing what he wanted him to do. Or he wasn't performing the way that Jesus thought he should perform. And so he says, don't be offended. Because Jesus was trying to let them know, I've been playing nice up to now. But i got to start doing some things because i got to lay a foundation. So I'm about to leave in a few weeks. And you all have to be able to hold this thing down until I come back for the church. And you're going to have to trust me even when it doesn't make sense to you or sense in your heart. Anybody ever felt like Jesus telling you to trust him and you know that it doesn't make sense? And everything that you say is go right and you know he telling you to go left? So he said, bless the day that are not offended because of me. He was saying, watch me, watch me because some of you are about to get shaken up. Because you think what I should be doing, and I'm not going to tell you. Let me reference Luke 24. You can just mark that and read that later, but it's a story of Cleopas, who was a disciple, who after the resurrection of Jesus, was on his way um, to Emmaus. It's one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Because these men were heading back to their old home because they didn't expect Jesus to be raised from the dead. And they were on their way back, and Jesus appeared to them, and he said, ask them where they were going and what they were doing. And they started saying, are you a stranger? Read the story. I don't want to go into it too far. But basically what happened is Jesus started talking to them until they got a revelation that they were talking to Jesus. Here's what I'm going to ask them. At what point did Cleopas get off track? And why wasn't Galilee on his itinerary? Because Jesus clearly says to the disciples, look, I'm going to die. I'm going to be, I'm going to be accused. I'm going to die. I'm going to be raised up. Meet me in Galilee. Meet me in Galilee, and I'll give you instructions there. Galilee is nowhere close to a man's. These folks were heading in another direction because they did not want to go where Jesus was leading them. Because they were offended. 
Something <coughs> Jesus said trapped them. Something Jesus said snared them. And he was offending them because there were people counting on him, doing stuff for them, taking him in places that he seemingly changed his mind on. But it's interesting that the word offense means a trap. And I don't know if any of you are hunters or trappers, but when you get trapped in something, that trap doesn't let you loose. Somebody's got to come and get you out of that trap. Right, that's right. Now there's some wild animals that have, you know, they have um, chewed their own paw to get out. To get out, because they know nobody else was good, that they couldn't get out. They did that kind of stuff to get themselves out. Because when that trap gets you, it doesn't let you go. Jesus says, "Some of you all are following me, but you're not really grasping what I'm saying. Some of you have become more groupies than followers, because a follower knows who they're following." But a groupie is hoping that the one you follow will somehow notice you and smile at you and give you thumbs up out there in the audience. A follower wants what's best, but a groupie is really just getting off, chasing their own lust, chasing their own fantasies, and they're just making you an object of it. But it's not really about you. A groupie just follows you around with no thought, no rhyme or reason, but a follower is intentional. A follower will just will, will, will stay true because they're committed to the one they're following. Because there's some righteousness inside their hearts. But a groupie is just showing up because this is the place to be. I have nothing else to do. I have nothing better to do. So I'm going to be a groupie. I'm just going to buy tickets and follow you around and hope that my life becomes fulfilled because I'm following you around. I don't want to be a Jesus group. I want to be a follower. I want to be a follower of the Lord. I want to do what he wants me to do. I want to see what he wants me to say. I want to be a follower of Jesus. But here's what I really want to know. When did followers become groupies? Because I don't think they all started off as groupies. I think some started off as followers. Because it would be strange to me that Jesus would pick only groupies and no true followers. And what he was doing, I would think that he needs some people that were serious about this thing. And who really wanted to do it the right way. So I want to look at some of these. I want to look at some of these people to see when they got off track. Because if we're going to believe who Jesus really claimed to be, that's going to change our lives, our situation, our attitudes, our priorities, our definition of success. And it's going to change our world. If we're going to really believe who Jesus says about us. So I want to start with Peter. I'm going to look at it for just a minute in, in, in lining up with, with Luke 7 and 23. When did Peter stop following Jesus? Because he was clearly he was clearly conflicted by his discipleship, but he was, con but he was convicted by his abandonment of Jesus. So then we've got to look at with, with Peter. Peter was rough. Peter was tough. He had a lot of mouth. He was, he was talking a lot. <laughs> Peter wanted to get stuff done. Some of your Peter's up in here. You don't want to play games. You believe that this is the Lord's work. Let's do it. Amen. Let's get serious about it. Yeah. Let's not play games. Let's sit around and talk about it. Let's do the Lord's work and let's do it now. Let's do it right. Some of you are the type of personality you don't want to play. Peter was serious. Stop playing with the worm. Put it on the hook. <laughs> Peter was one of the kind of fishermen that would say, hey, hey, stop playing in the water. You ever go fishing with a real fisherman? Now, if you were people that aren't really serious about fishing, you throw tea, twigs in the water, you know, you skipping rocks and stuff like that. Because you, you do that with a real fisher. A real fisher will, sl will slap you in the mouth. <laughs> Nothing's bitten your hook in days. But a real fisher will say, no, here they come. Here they come right now. Because when, you know, when that twig's kind of in the water, uh, oh, here's some old school stuff. When the um, dragonfly land on a bobber. Yeah. <laughs> it's some old school superstition now. Some people know what I'm talking about. That dragonfly land on your bobber. Some get a bite. I'm about to get a bite. I'm about to get some prophecy. Now, real deep fish would take shh, like fish got ears. Shh. <laughs> but nothing makes a fisher mad if folks who don't take the water serious. Yeah. And so you playing and splashing, and I want to go swimming, and it's hot, and I want to eat it. <laughs> you down to the last worm, and you someplace, you know, throwing it up in the air and stuff like that. <laughs> You're trying to fish for real, and then you're throwing your line all up in trees and stuff, and a real fisher, and everybody knows that as soon as your friend gets a snag, that's when you're going to get a bite. Fish don't bite at all, but as soon as you cast your line up in the tree and you're trying to pull it down, that's 
lesson, you're going to start getting a bite on your line. Then a big old sturgeon is going to pull your pole right into the water while you're up with this foolishness. <laughs> and now your zip code. You done learned to fish with an open face reel. Now it's, now it's swimming up Wisconsin River. He was very serious about his craft and his work. But let me tell you some things that Jesus did. Or take it to the mind of Peter because Peter's a man. And we're supposed to read scripture like it's a story. Because we don't know the full psychology on Peter, but we know his prototype. And some of us have makeup like Peter so we can understand what might be in his heart. Let me just help you understand Peter for just a little bit. He was rough, he was rugged, he was non subtle, he was a go getter. And perhaps Jesus' continual reference to a crucifixion or death seemed weak to him. Now stay with me for just a minute. Peter left the business. We just think people fish. Most people we know don't fish for a living. I mean, they may fish because it's funny. They might even eat it. But it's not like when you go to Pike's Market in Seattle or some of these places where people are really fishing for a living. They go out to sea. They catch fish. This is how they make their living. This is how they send their kids to school. This is how they buy clothes. It's a serious thing. Peter left fishing and his business to follow Jesus. You follow when Jesus, every time you turn around, he's saying, somebody's going to kill me. Now, I'm not trying to make fun of Jesus. I'm trying to tell you how a go-getter hears this kind of stuff. Stay with me for just a minute. He didn't rebuke Jesus for talking about death. He rebuked him. He didn't comfort him. He rebuked him. Man, would you do some push-ups and man? <laughs> you hanging. You're trying to get some business taken care of. And your friends are scared. That's not comforting to you. Remember my younger years. Before I was serious. <laughs> I like to do Darren, but nothing illegal because I don't want to go to jail. But I remember Darren some friends. You know, it was hot one night and there was a pool someplace. Let's chop the fence, dive in the pool, and let's get on out and go finish hanging us with some dessert or something like that. What about the police? What if somebody sees? I'm like, we're not still in the car. We're diving in the pool. They took all the fun out of it. <laughs> So finally, I just said, forget it. I jumped the fence. It was Ronnie Tap. I'm thinking, you play basketball for Wisconsin. You a tough job. You talk about going to the police. I go, forget it. I jump over the fence. I dive in the pool with 12 foot. I hear like the fence going, shh. Ronnie's running to the car. So even if the police did come, there's nobody telling me they coming. If I bump my head, they're like telling me to help me out the pools. I'm like, we're supposed to be friends. You, you can just say, I told them not to. But you gonna run? I'm trying to run with you. And you running without me. I lost all kind of athletic respect for him. Yeah, is that weird? Jesus, you're talking um, about death. A, Peter rebukes him. Peter, he rebukes him. I don't rebuke his. Rebuke his and let's shh. It's a rebuke. What's your problem? Why do you keep saying this stuff? I don't think. I mean, that's. You have shown, promised we have left everything to follow you. Man, the heck up. He rebuked him. Jesus rebukes him back. Right. I said, wait, 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 wait. You trying to tell me I can have a crown without a crucifixion? That ain't how it goes. And you trying to get me to live without dying is not the plan of God. But Peter didn't get that, all right? Peter then says on another occasion, all right, all right, all right. Let's say they come. I got you. I got you. If they come with the sword, I got you. I, I may not be a swordsman, but I know how to take some string and wrap around that neck. Calming him down. I'm like, okay, baby. I was under the bed. There's no boogie around there. I was in the closet. There's no ghost in there. He's trying to calm Jesus down. I checked. There's nothing bad that's going on. They go up in the mountain. Moses and uh, Elijah appear to Jesus. Peter's thinking, do you feel better now? Now you got your, some backup from your boys. Maybe we're not enough. They come from heaven to tell you, go, Jesus. Now, would you 
please get some strength to do a few push-ups? Would you please? Would you please do this thing? Jesus comes in John 13. Goes and takes his clothes off. He's on an apron. Gets down in the pan of water. Starts to wash Peter's nasty feet. Peter gets mad. Because you don't want your kid coming. Because you want to you look up to him. You don't want the president or somebody coming in who you look up to, your favorite star, your favorite musician, and you want them to be a little distant and a little stately, and they come in like acting like they don't know what to do, and they're shuffling and diving, and they want to wash your feet, and they want to, you know, you know, just think, like, no, 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 I, I want to feel good about you, and you want to wipe between my little toe? <laughs> and you act like you like it, you act like you know what you're doing. <laughs> It's like seeing your parents cry. It scares you. Because the people who uphold strength who you're Gibraltar, when they lose it, you begin to think that the whole world has, has unraveled. Remember the first time you saw your parent cry? The first time you saw your father cry? Remember you just start thinking, what's going on? Because they're always the one telling you not to cry. So when you feel like something's going off the hinge, you're worried, you're frustrated about it. When Jesus got there and started wiping Wait. Peter's feet, Peter started, no, no, no! Because Peter had an ideal of Jesus that did not involve washing his feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me give one last example. I'm just trying to help you understand Peter. You in a fight. You don't get to raise your hands. Brother Cole, you in a fight. Let me see. Who looks like they've been in a fight? Ladera, you looking down. Ladera, you in a fight. Now, see, you should just look at somebody like it's not even good. You in a fight. Marcus is running his mouth. You're not fighting Marcus because y'all boys, right? Marcus, is, you know, he's got some stuff. Hey, there, somebody trying to take my stuff, take my car, they messing with my daughter, messing with my wife, and, you know, so I just need you to be around so that nothing pops off, okay? Rob, you're a soldier, so you're doing this, all right? Your enemy runs up on you, Marcus, and he's like talking smack. The Daryl is Peter. You step between the boy and Marcus. Hey, 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 hey.
willingly. You willingly gave yourself over to your own enemy. But I was willing to fight for you. You just going to cower down like that? I don't know. You got a, you got an accent like you're from Galilee. I don't know. I now understand why Peter was cussing. Because men don't like that. Again, I'm not trying to build doctrine. I'm just trying to help us to understand personality. Judas. He must have had some good that Jesus chose him to follow. But you know what's interesting to me? That in John 12, Mary, while Jesus at Bethany, pours some perfume over Jesus' head. It's Judas that said, I know this bra. <laughs> I know this girl didn't just break this body and pour all this oil on this man's head. Did he look like he had damage? Did he look like he needed a hot oil treatment? Was he frizzy? Judas says, we could have saved this and we could have sold it to the poor. Jesus says, shut up, Judas. <laughs> Poor you have with you always. You don't have me always. You don't have me my burial. That's John 12. John 13. And the devil enters into Judas's heart. And he betrays Jesus. The very next chapter. I think Judas is saying, you know what? I like Jesus. Because Jesus can do an offering. And I carry it. I hold the box. And every once in a while, I help myself. Because I think the treasure ought to be on Saturday. <coughs> and listen, he ain't going to miss it. I watched him snap his finger. And a fish swam to the top of the sea. And spit a coin out on the ground. So that he could send us to go pay taxes to Caesar. He ain't going to miss his Benjamin. When you saw Jesus throwing money around, let people take expensive money that could have been used for him and his car, his rims, his spinners, his new cell phone. The next chapter, Jesus was like, you know what? They were being offended by Jesus' people. They were being offended. Cleopas and the other disciple. They said, we had hoped be the one that would restore Israel. We had hoped that he was going to pull down Roman occupation. We had hoped that he would restore David's throne and our place. We had hoped that he would be the one. But the other disciples, when the women ran and said, we saw the angel who told us Jesus was raised, they didn't believe the women. The women went to the grave with spices because they thought he was not that he was, that he was not risen. What am I saying with all of this stuff? What, what, what am I trying to point at? At some point, his followers became groupies. They started following Jesus because of what Jesus could do for them. They started following Jesus, and then when Jesus didn't pay them, when Jesus didn't hook them up, when Jesus did not make life better, they sold them out. Peter said, I don't know. Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver, and then when he told him who he was, he didn't even have, he didn't even have enough strength to even say, y'all go find him. I just tell you what, what, where he is, what, what, what garden he's in. <coughs> no, Judas, pay, they got paid by them. Then Judas said, the one I'm going to kiss. Yeah. So I'm going to act like we cool. I'm going to kiss him. And the one I kiss, that's the one I want y'all to grab. Mm. They were offended. What does offense mean? It means that something Jesus did trapped them. And it snared them. And it got them stuck. And they couldn't move ahead. But you know what? Romans 9.33. It says, as, I written, as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. 1 Peter 2 and 8. They stumbled being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. In John 6, 51 through 61, Jesus says, you know what? I'm the living bread. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. 
They said, this is a hard saying. We don't feel like eating this man's flesh. They stopped following me because they said, this is a hard saying. And Jesus said, does this offend you? Is what I'm saying offensive? He's asking because he knows that when he begins to really put it out there, people are going to have to choose whether they really want this Jesus. This is what Jesus is really saying in Luke 7, 23. Let me just paraphrase. <coughs> Blessed is what is not given to me. He's saying, really, people, I found you in all your trouble and all of your mess, and I love you. But now you'll be offended because I'm standing my ground and I'm being who I am. Caught in active adultery, I loved you. Punched over, I loved you. With a hand, I loved you. Dead daughter, I loved you. Fleeing for 12 years, I loved you. A crooked tax collector, I loved you. A known drug dealer, I sat in your house and drank at your diamond goblets and was not ashamed of you. You know what I'm saying? Blessed is the one that's not ashamed and who is not offended by me. Because I get ready to really show you who I am. He's going to show who you are. The real question is not whether or not I accept you. The question is, do you accept him? Because he's rough around the edges. And he wants to push the envelope and it's offensive. He said, do you think I really came to send peace? I came to send mother against daughter, father against son. And whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus wasn't saying he wants daughters beating up on their mothers and sons beating up on their fathers. He was saying this. I want your love for me to be above what you have for your mother. And if your mother says no and I say yes, it must be yes. And many people, when he said, let the dead bury the dead, well, that's insensitive. He said, the dead, they can't do nothing else. Follow me. Well, let me go sell the ox that I have. No, 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 no. Because if you put your hands in the plow and you stop and you look back, you're not fit for my kingdom. They were offended. The rich young ruler came and said, what must I do to have eternal life? But he told them. He went away sorrowful because he had many riches. We love Jesus and we think that we're a follower. And Jesus, this is what a follower does. And we fall into the groupie category. My Lord, my Lord. We love how he dresses us up. We love how we make to feel. We get good seats and good positions. We get bottled water. We get good seats and we get to sing. But when he tells you, lay down your mess, lay down your lies, lay down your attitude. I want your resources. I want your heart. I want your children to be in the word. I want you to forgive. I want you to, I want you to be unified. I want you to build bridges. I want you to step away from sin. Well, Lord, I don't think that you have a right to tell me that. I don't think you have a right to tell me how to begin. You don't know what my father did to me. You don't know what my mother did to me. You don't know what those people, those black people, those white people, those Asian people, you have no right to come and tell me, God. You know, when God has certain standards, we start getting all messy with God because he's not telling you stuff that we don't really want to do, that we don't really want to feel. And we realize, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm at a point. Because my next action is about to determine whether or not I'm a follower or a group. Because a follower loves being molded by the one that follows. A groupie is not connected emotionally or intellectually to the one that follows. They're making it all up in their head. This is what they want. They see me. They see me. He looked at me. He waved at me. She waved. She winked at me. They don't know them. The person on stage is afraid of the group. Because followers will see you get beat up and will make people leave you alone. Groupies will kidnap you and lock you in the basement. I've seen the movie, Misery. Because <laughs> <laughs> they know she was a groupie. <laughs> Ty James coming up. Remember that scene when she broke his ankle? <laughs> Some of y'all just felt that when I said it Well, it wasn't just like this, bro. I was like, Bro, if you know about them groupies, you laugh when I said that. <laughs> Michael, don't you laugh? <laughs> you know them too. Watch them groupies. They ain't healthy and they ain't saved. them if they did a U-turn on that road to Emmaus and went back. Peter! Hey, have you caught anything? Hey, that sounds funny. It's like it's the Lord who jumps in the water and swims to shore. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, love me. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thomas! 
He walks through the wall. Well, Thomas, come put your hand right here. Come on, boy. Come on, Thomas. Right here on my side, Billy, because I know you need this. I know you need this. I know you need it. What I love about Jesus is that it doesn't matter how you got off track. He spent those 40 days chasing down those who were offended. Why? Because the Bible says if you have a gift and you're offended by somebody, leave your gift at the altar and get it right with the person. <laughs> Does this offend you? He said, Let's eat my blood and drink my flesh. He said it to me. He says, Does this offend you? What he really was saying is, Do you have a problem with this? Because he's trying to let them know I am the bread. Y'all about to gather here and pass over, eat some unleavened bread, and think that you're right with God. If you accept what I'm about to do, you'll be right with God forever. In fact, you will reign with God. In fact, you will sit with God. In fact, Scripture tells you you will judge the world. In fact, Scripture tells you where you will be and where you will be positioned. Scripture tells you this. Does this offend you? You think that it's offensive that I'm telling you to eat my blood? I'm not asking you to be careful. I'm not asking you to not clean and chunk down on me. I'm just trying to let you know. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. I am that loaf of barley that Gideon saw that tumbled down into the valley. That the man saw in, in Gideon's story and crushed the enemies. I'm a mean loaf of bread. Yeah. But is this a feature? <coughs> but with Cleo, it's Luke 24. Anybody feel like you're straight from God, you need to love and own Luke 24. To talk to them. He asked them questions. He pretended like he was leaving. Jesus was an actor, Professor Sims. He pretended like he was about to leave. He said, exit stage right. Okay, it's getting late. He said, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Let's, I know you all unlearned, you all clueless, but it's still dark. Somebody as gullible as you. People will beat you up, take your lunch money. Come on to our house. Come on to our house. There's something about the way Jesus broke that bread. There's something about the way he took it and he broke it. That we broke it. He said, you know, the last time somebody broke bread like that, they were saying, take it, eat, because my body's going to be offered up. And their eyes were open. As the took out our hearts <clears throat> within us as he spoke, he drew them, and he drew them, and he drew them, and he drew them until they were whole. Thomas, he gave him what he needed. I would have wanted Thomas. I would have told him everything he was thinking. I would have told him what color socks were. What color socks he almost I would have played with his mind. That's why I'm not Jesus, because I'm still. But he gave him what he needed. He spent 40 days reteaching what they did not understand in three years. And then to cap it off, he ascended right in front of them. Because they weren't there when he was born. They were there when he left. So that they would know he wouldn't hide now. So that seven years later, they wouldn't be having this Machiavelli conversation. Jesus and Tupac or someplace on the island of Patmos. <laughs> Although Tupac really is still alive. But Jesus. <laughs> Jesus ain't over there with him. He is sitting in front of them so that they would have a testimony. He's not here anymore. These men and women died because of what they saw. They couldn't be offended because they weren't become, about to become rich. They could not be offended because they were not about to become famous. They could not be offended because he was not going to hook them up. Because these men and women were about to have their heads cut off. And about to be killed because of their trust. And if you mad because Jesus let you get the man you want or the woman you want or the job you want. If you can't handle Jesus saying no... How can you handle your life being at stake with your faith in Jesus? He had to work the offense out of their souls. He had to convince them that not only were they serving the right one, they were serving the righteous one. And if we start becoming offended by the way Jesus does things, he'll make it. He'll never make it in faith because he states in Isaiah 55, 7 through 9. My grandmother drilled this in me. I'm sure you heard this. 
Marcus, I'm sure you heard this. She drilled, she drilled it in us. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts above your ways. Thoughts. Some of us people are offended. You're in a trap. Because you think, Jesus, how could you let this happen? I remember being, I said this one time, it's, it's funny, but it's sad. But it's one time we're in the hospital, and we're losing the process of losing our first daughter. <coughs> and mom said that she remembered me in the hospital room saying, Lord, it's us. Now, I led the lady because we needed something, you know, we needed something to kind of, you know, give us some despise, but we kind of laughed, that's the funny thing to say to the Lord, like, you don't know who you are. <laughs> but that was a cry of desperation, like, you know our history. You know what we believe. You know what we've stood for. It's, it's us. It's like somebody coming up and you're mad. You would say, hey, you in the wrong place. It's us. Don't do this here. It's us. It's easy to get offended. This is not where it's supposed to be. But you know what's interesting? Cleopas could have never opened that trap. Peter could have never opened that trap. Thomas could never have opened that trap. Jesus had to come and pry it open. Like, Put your hand on my side, Thomas. That's how he got out. Peter, do you love me? That's how Peter got out. Cleopas. Take your foot up. Take your foot up. He rebuked them. I said, didn't you read in scripture that he taught them from Moses to the prophets? Right. Did not the Son of Man come to earth to give up his life as a ransom for many and be raised up again? He told them what scripture said and let them out. Folks, some of us are not able to go to the next level because we are offended by something that did not go your way. And you can shout and dance a little and beat your tambourines and sing. But you can only go so far. Because you got a trap. And you can't get things right in relationships. You can't get things right in faith. Because you're trapped. And you think it's God's fault and I'm in the wrong church. I'm in the wrong version of the Bible. It's somebody else's fault. But you step over the trap and you're offended by Jesus. You've taken offense because Jesus has become a scandal to you. Because what he tells you to do is unconscionable. Love Samaritans. Love Gentiles. Eat with them. Let our children marry them. Worship in their communities. Just when you think Jesus won't do it, that's the thing he's going to change. Just when you think you can't loathe anybody, that's the one he's going to tell you to love. Now he's going to tell you to love them. He's going to put what you need inside of them. So that if you don't love them, you don't get what you, don't, what you need. Let me show you our challenge the next step. So I want to pray for you. In what area of your life are you most prone to be offended by Jesus and his teachings? Is it in financial stewardship? Is it in dis disciplined living? Is it in forgiveness? Unity? Faith? Personal holiness? Being critical? Judgmental? You've got to know where you're prone because guess what? He's going to come and do it. He's going to nudge. He's going to push you. How's that feel? Are you offended? Are you offended? Are you offended now? Are you offended now? If you think Jesus cares about your comfort, you don't know him yet. You don't strap somebody on the cross and they talk to them about comfort. That's why your mother would tell you, what you mean you don't want to? You know how long I was in labor? They didn't have epidurals 50 years ago, boy. You didn't just get that big head. You think I want to stir? You think I want all of that? <laughs> you, 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 
you don't get out of here and get somewhere to sit down. Remember, that's what you know. That's you know you're afraid to get somewhere to sit down. I'll just get out of here. They'll tell you two things. Two things. Either get out of my face or get somewhere and sit down. Now get out of your face, me. Some a Pepsi bottle, RC bottle, something happened. They're trying to let you know. Look, look, I'm over the air. I can't control what's about to happen. You better, you better get out of my face. But go somewhere and sit down means I need you to sit down and think about what you just said. Go somewhere and sit down. Think about it. Where are you most prone to be offended? Cover that thing. Second point. What happens to your spiritual walk when you're offended by Jesus? Now, this is a real one. Don't you just scoot over, third over this. These are already uploaded to, uh, to the blog. We're gonna, you can find this on our Facebook. Uh, we'll tweet this out too. You can find all of this challenge in all of my notes. What happens to your spiritual walk? It's why some people don't show up. It's why some people don't worship. It's why some people don't give. It's why some people don't grow because you're stuck. Not just because you're mad at somebody, because Jesus told you to love somebody you're mad at. Remember when I was praying with some of my brothers, praying with me on Saturday nights, challenging me in my relationship with my father. I got angry with them because I felt like they were siding up with him against me. With all the stuff he'd done, how you gonna tell me to reconcile with him? I was angry, I was offended. Because I felt that what they were saying could be substantiated in the Bible, in the Bible. And I'm trying to come back with feelings and emotion. That doesn't stand up against Jesus. I want to get offended. So I wanted people to side with me. I want y'all to hate who I hate. You my boys. You can be talking like this, but what if I want to roll up on them one day and do something? Jesus said love. Jesus said forgive. If you don't forgive, you can't forgive. Listen, listen, listen. I taught you the Bible. I knew you when you had ankle person. Don't come preach to me. Just strap up, Bobby. Just strap up. <laughs> Their brothers help me work through that. That was the evidence to my healing. And I was offended that Jesus would want that. Three, wrestle with understanding what role trust must play in a healthy relationship with Jesus. Because faith can tell He can move mountains, He can raise the dead, yeah, yeah, yeah. But trust means you understand His nature. Trust, you didn't even be fearful if you need it, but trust means I'm going to walk out and do this just because you told me to. I know that you would never do anything to hurt me. That's what trust means. Trust means if you tell me to do it, I'm going to forgive just because it's right. I don't know how to, but you, I want you to help me. What role is trust? Is trust a part of your relationship with you? If not, ask him. Help me to trust you. And the last point, commit yourself to prayer, fellowship, introspection, and accountability. Tell me to become free from your trap of offense. Because if you're trapped someplace, people got to come help you get out. Jesus will raise people up to get you. But watch it. Because he might send the people who you're offended by to help you out. They may come and you know what? I don't want you to come. I don't want you to come. Let me tell you this. I'm going to mess with Presbyterians for just a minute. Any Presbyterians in here? Not in a bad way. I'm just saying. But I came out of a black Pentecostal tradition. And I kind of dabbled with some word of faith stuff. That wasn't what I was proud of it, but what I dabbled in. When I lost, I first, we lost our first two babies. My prayer friends told me I didn't have enough faith. The friends who I was taught didn't have faith and stay away from them, my white Presbyterians. Them bad boys prophesied me up out that depression that I was in. He didn't say, Thus said the Lord, he said, She's gonna be small, and you're gonna bring this one home. He sat down Thanksgiving Day, 1996, and told me she's gonna be small, and she's gonna bring this one home. They're you, you think they speak to you. They don't know God's word, they're not spirit filled, they're not spirit led. My friends who were deep told me I didn't have enough faith. Them folks almost taught me how to cuss. Because there's nothing like knowing you moving in faith. Somebody tell you, you don't have it. I'm not making fun of prayer. Y'all hear the spirit of what I'm saying? I can hear nobody telling me, well, you didn't pray, you didn't pray enough. I did. I did. I know faith. So you've got to be careful. Because
because you need to commit yourself to prayer, fellowship, and introspection, and accountability. Because you're quiet, and you don't want them noisy people. Listen, let me tell you something. Them noisy people have shot you loose. You don't take all of that, you know. I'm time, I'm old time, I don't need nobody doing all this language, prayer, and nobody. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Them the little prayer ladies will come talking tongues in your ear, spit in your face. And get a little, I'm telling you what I know. I'm t- I watched it happen. She made me look at all unassuming. Real hair might be showing underneath the wind. I'm telling you, I've seen it. I've seen them ladies get down on their knees and wrestle women who are out of demon over here. I've seen it. I've seen them finally dress past and not even want to wrinkle their own suits. But them old mothers got down there. Tell them thank you, honey. Tell them thank you, honey. Tell them thank you, honey. They were, they were midwives and will give birth to deliverance. Watch who you can stand. That's who God is sending you. That's who he sent it to you. To free you from your offense. Let's bow our heads. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm afraid of you.